ATN World News. News and inspiration with Leah Tillock. Hello and welcome to ATN World News. I'm Leah and it's great to be with you, the listeners all around the world. Well, if you've been following us on our daily news blog or social sites or websites, you know I've been promoting that we're going to be having Richard Shaw on, who's done the Torah Codes and uh, produced the Watcher series. And he's had quite an illustrious uh, career with this skill and are you? Film producer, director, the movies, documentaries. Like I said, most of you have come to know him through the uh, tour codes and the watches series. And with that, I'd like to say good evening, Richard. Hi, Leah. Thanks so much for having me on. It sounds like it's going to be a blast. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you've done so many intriguing and cutting edge uh, things. Uh, some of the things in the watches series are so uh, cutting edge. And people, we're going to be getting into that later on in the program. But I thought I'd start off uh, a little bit about uh, what Richard is noted for uh, is a, a wonderful uh, package on, on Blu-ray uh, of a Torah code. It's amazing stuff, people. Why don't you share with our followers a little bit about this, Richard? Thanks. I'll be happy to. Well, a long time ago, I caught a television show where a guy named Michael Drossen was talking about his book that he was coming out with, and it was called The Bible Code. And this was like in, I don't know, 98, I guess. And I, I was out in Hollywood helping to uh, kind of associate produce a, a show out here. And so I was at a hotel and flipped on my TV and saw this this guy with, with this book. So uh, what's, what code is in the Bible? And he had such interesting stuff to say. Of course, on the front of the cover of his book, there was this table that said, Yitzhak Rabin, assassin, will assassinate. And it basically had predicted the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin a, a year before it had actually taken place. So I'm going, well, it's in the Torah. It, it, there's no telling what's encoded in those books. So I bought the book, read it on the plane coming home, and was just, I just thought it was amazing. So, you know, I'd always kind of, you know, later on uh, in other years, I moved back out to Hollywood and started my own company, Pinlight, and my friend Lee came over one afternoon, and, and we got to talking about films we wanted to do, and I said, I'd like to do a film about the Torah codes, but I have no idea how I would be able to do that, because I don't know the rabbis and professors, whether they'd even speak to me, I have no money to do it, and it's just like... Well, that is that. You know, we were already working on another show. So I've told this story before, but I still have to tell it because it's so bizarre. Lee uh, had flown to Japan to co-produce a concert tour with, with the artist Ricky Lee Jones. A lot of people know who she is. She got famous uh, for her first big hit called Chucky's in Love. And she's done, I don't know, a dozen albums since then. And so he was in Japan with her. When he flew home, he decided to go visit his brother, Paul, who lives in New York. So he goes to the airport to get on the flight, and they cancel it. Bad weather or something. So they tell him to come back in two or three days. So he does. So now he has no idea what his seat assignment is or anything like that. It was jet blue. He gets on the plane, and his random seat assignment putting next to this guy that looked like a rabbi. And so they sat down and talked for five hours and ended up, ended up sitting next to Professor Robert Herlich from City University in New York, who is the guy writing a lot of the software to search the Torah. And Robert knew all of the world experts, Professor Reps, you know, Rabbi Glazerson, Art Levitt. I mean, this whole bunch of like world experts, Dr. Alexander Rodenberg, all of them. So when Lee landed in LaGuardia, he calls me all excited on his phone. I go, what, Lee, what? He goes, I think this is the guy you're going to want to talk to. And he phoned to Robert, and there I was connected with the whole inner core of Torah Code experts. Now, that's been 10 years ago, and since then, several of us have become really close friends. 
And I never in my wildest dreams would have thought anything like that could have happened. It was really amazing. I, I know it must be staggering looking back and, and thinking about it. And, and then you take your trip to Israel and you record this incredible piece, this documentary. And uh, people, uh, there's so much uh, on this. I encourage you to go ahead and uh, look it up and uh, get a copy for yourself uh, of, of the Torah codes. I mean, was there one thing that any particular rabbi said to you while you were in Israel uh, doing this that stood out in your mind above everything else? Well, it, I'll never forget a phone call that I had with Professor Ripps the evening before I interviewed him. And I said, you know, at, at the time I was also working with Ellie Marzulli on uh, Watchers. And we had just finished doing Watchers 7 and Watchers 8, I believe it was at the time that I went to Israel. And so I had this this model of the baby mummy skull. And you don't know what I'm talking about unless you see Watchers 8. But essentially, we we were allowed to unwrap this baby mummy in, in Peru. It's a head from this child who was probably 18 to 24 months old. And it had never been unwrapped. It was still in mummy wrapping. And we filmed the whole process. We did carbon-14 on it. We took DNA samples from it. Everyone was gloved, wearing masks. It was really serious. When we unwrapped it, this mummy's head was, like, elongated. And it was, like, huge. And there's just no way that this could have happened unless the child had been born that way. Because the mummy wrappings, I mean, to wrap a child's head so it would get that large... Uh, there wasn't time to enlarge its head without killing it, essentially. So, and we don't believe that's what happened because there was too much cranial mass there for that to have been achieved. So I wanted to show that to Professor Rips because I thought he would find it interesting. Now, you have to understand, Professor Rips is, is given the credit pretty much for being the discoverer of the Torah codes, and yet he always sighs when you say that because he he really wants to also credit uh, several other people that were highly involved in the process. One was Doran Woodstam, who did a lot of the coding work on the software, and another was Joab Rosenberg. And then since then, uh, he's had he's collaborated with others, like Professor Herlick and Rabbi Glazerson, and also um, uh, Dr. Alex Rotenberg. And so he doesn't like to get the credit for it, but Rips is pretty much spearheaded the process, I guess you would say. So I told him I wanted to show him this this baby mummy uh, replica that I brought to Israel just to show him. And then I also told him about all of these UFOs that have been sighted. Uh, I, I know I'm jumping around here, but to me, all these things are connected. So it's kind of like I can't talk about them. <laughs> it's It's funny because... The things that are happening in the world right now are incredibly supernatural, and yet most of them are ignored. But when I told Rips about this, and then I had some footage I wanted him to see, he he got his voice went higher, and he said, "People have no idea of the supernatural things that are going on in this universe." And he started almost preaching at me over the phone, and the hair on my arms stood up. Because this is a guy that is a rabbi who I seriously respect for being, for his intellect, one thing, and his humility, another. And he's a really smart guy. And and he just came out of the box because he said, people have no idea what's going on in this universe. And I agree. And so the things that we're finding out in the Torah Codes are and continue to be simply astonishing. I just put up a new code table, and I sent you a copy of it, Lynn, so you could see it. Yes, um, I think I got that code table, and it uh, was amazing, and I need to look at it more, but I looked at it a little bit before the uh, broadcast. And um, what uh, this gentleman said is true. The supernatural is going on 
uh, all about us. And uh, those who are alert uh, and uh, and keeping a watch, like a watchman, I mean, you can you can see these things. Uh, a lot of people go to the just just are not alert. I don't know if it's the fluoride in the drinking water or the processed food <laughs> or what or the spirit, spiritual state of gadgets. I don't know, but they're kind of dumbed down a little. And we are trying to say, look, you know, you need to be alert to, to know what's going on for your own soul's sake and for your uh, family's sake. With that, you mentioned well, a little bit about the uh, mummy skull. I want to go ahead and, and get into that with the Watcher series, and you just talk about what comes to your mind. You've done so many of them, oh, uh, Richard. Sure. But the, let me just briefly close this part of our discussion by saying that table that I sent you, I thought it was so outrageous that I put it up on my website so everybody could see it. And so if you go to pinlight.com, P-I-N-L-I-G-H-T.com, and if you scroll down underneath the black and white movie about the Fibonacci sequence and, and look under that, it, it's basically a Torah code that Rabbi Glazerson discovered, which kind of, it freaked me out a bit. But basically it says, in the end of days, now this is in the code, crossing that vertically is the word Nibiru, which Everyone pretty much knows now what that is, it's like Planet X. And all this was all found uh, also right near a, a diagonal code that says in 5776. That's the Hebrew calendar year for 2016. And then it says warning, like that there's going to be a warning. But all of this code was basically superimposed over the plain text in the book of Numbers that says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And through that scripture, we have Nibiru in the end of days appears. <laughs> so when he sent me that, I'm going, oh my gosh, that's just really un- incredible. Yes, I've heard people talk about Nibiru and things like this, but to actually see it encoded and then the scripture, it is utterly amazing. We saw so many amazing things also in, in the Watcher series. Uh, you told me a little bit earlier today how um, you had just gotten to California and L.A. called you up about working with the Watcher series, if you want to explain a little bit more. Well, yeah, we were... It was a very weird time. It was there was a massive recession going on. It was 2009, 2010, right around that area, and a lot of the uh, film cutting labs in Hollywood were closing, and people were going out of business left and right. People were being fired for their jobs, and it was it wasn't just because of the recession, but it was also a technological revolution that was taking place out here. People were going from film to digital. Um, people were going from pressing CDs to iTunes. And people were being displaced because of technology. So fortunately, I was already used to operating and recording everything digitally and even our camera at the time. Um, back in those days, we had a Canon XLH1, which was uh, basically a, a high definition camcorder uh, that was kind of expensive in those days, and it was all digitized to my Mac. So I've been doing that kind of stuff for a long time. In fact, we even did a, a cast where we took um, digitized uh, HD video and printed it to 35 millimeter film to see how it would hold up. And we even had because it was so intriguing to the Film companies out here, um, e-film decided to get involved with us and, and do a test with us and didn't charge us for it because they wanted to see what it would look like too. So we're all curious. So those were those days. So I get this call from LA saying, uh, would you direct a, a film about UFOs? And it's LA. So I already knew and were, was friends with LA for two or three years before he asked me this and, 
I said, uh, do we have a budget? He said, that's the first thing you have to find out. He goes, well, we've got, I think we had $5,000. I said, okay, well, how long does the film need to be? What are you looking to do? Because, I mean, I had no idea what he wanted or anything like that other than UFOs has always intrigued me. And, I, you know, I studied them myself, so it wasn't like I was a complete novice about them. And he said, it needs to be an hour. <laughs> So, I don't know what came over me, but I agreed to do it. And, of course, the the 5000 had to be repaid. It was basically a loan. So, I'm going, all right, Ellie, how are we going to sell these copies so we can actually pay for the project? Because he thought people would buy it. And said, okay, because it's L.A., I will do it. So we did the first Watchers, and I came up with the name because I'd been reading out of the Book of Enoch, and I was so intrigued with that book. I mean, I was like, couldn't believe what I was reading. It was so amazing. So we called it The Watchers, and we burned a 100 copies of it, and they were they sold like in a week. And I'm going, well, that's weird. So I told LA, I said, I guess we need to make an actual DVD box and all of that. And I said, okay. So we printed a thousand of them and those sold like in a month. Then all of a sudden we realized, wow, people are looking for this kind of information. So then we had to sit down and figure out what is the watchers? Is it an episodic series? What do we do in it? And so I suggested, well, let's do another one and we'll just number them from now on. Instead of going to the watchers, we'll call it watchers two, watchers three. So now, Leia, we're, we just released Watchers 10. And if someone had told me we'd be doing these uh, with some regular basis, I wouldn't have believed it. You know, they are so popular. Um, last year when I was talking to L.A., he told me that there are people that have Watchers uh, parties. And uh, yeah. they'll get a bunch of their friends together or people who don't know anything. And he said... He thought it was a great form of witness because he said that you all went out and proved the scriptures to be true by what you found and by what you investigate. And uh, he thought it was, uh, you know, saying what a great uh, evangelistic tool it was, thought it was uh, very timely. And he was telling me the great breakthroughs in these uh, group parties that, that people were having. My friend Lee, again, called us before I got on the show here and said that um, one of our friends in Connecticut named Ben is uh, making T-shirts for us, Watchers T-shirts, because now we have requests for T-shirts. <laughs> and we tried that years ago and no one bought any, so I thought, well, I'm kind of hesitant to do it again. But now people are asking for, for Watchers T-shirts. In fact, um, they're making their own just to have one. And I'm going, okay, we got to make something. So lean into this guy named Ben, and it, it's, it's a whole group of young guys that work at the print shop there, and they're watchers fanatics, and they're going to have like a watchers marathon. I just sent them like a 10 DVD set so they could have them all. And, I mean, I'm blown away. In closing, uh I'd like to just uh, give you the time to express yourself of what you'd like to maybe see or a message you want to give listeners or uh, something you just want to say. The floor is yours, Richard. Go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I I don't have anything real profound to say other than I do think that we're living in very significant times, as my friend Rabbi Glazerson would say, and always does, that we're seeing things occur that that appear to be what has been prophesied for years in ancient texts about the return of the Messiah. I know like a lot of the of my Jewish friends really believe that we're approaching that time period, that things are so crazy in the world. And, and what's interesting also is the idea that there could be some sort of disclosure, meaning that uh, all of this uh, subterfuge that has been out there for the past 60 years about UFOs and aliens and all of that, 
that I think we're about to see some of the the veil peeled back on all of that a bit. I think we're going to start. There may be an announcement even uh, from our government that that we are not being invaded, but that uh, aliens are among us. I believe they're going to say, and it's like people are are more apt now to accept the fact that that's true than they were even 10 years ago because it's been a source of ridicule and people are, their reputations are at stake if you say something like that. But there's just simply too much evidence that can't be ignored of what's going on in the world. And Jaime Masson sent me 500 pieces of video with UFOs on them from all over the world. And he always has more. And when you, when you start looking at that much material, granted, some of it might be poor photography or some of it's not a UFO and you have to examine it, see what it is. But there's so many of them now that are unexplained phenomena where these crafts are doing things in the skies that are mostly impossible for us to do anything that to be seeing that and the Torah codes and, and the, creatures that are unexplained like the fairy and all of these things it's it's really wild what's happening right now in this world and i think it's really fascinating and we have to study it we have to tell people what's going on yes there's there's a feeling of urgency to get the information out i can really personally see it the setup for the strong delusion uh, for for the end of days, um, my uh, following they know how I feel that it's an alien deception uh, that they're really demons, uh, a ton of them, uh, with with the spaceships and and this and that, doing this or that, and pawning themselves off as aliens to uh, to deceive. But I I'm trusting in God uh, that uh, it, the Scripture definitely says that the elect cannot be deceived if it, if it were possible. So I encourage everyone That's to pray right. in the Word, stay faithful to God, because you can't be deceived uh, if, if you're the elect. He said, if it were possible, it was such a strong delusion. Strong, man, strong. And, and everything yeah, that and Richard uh, has told you, it's strong, you know? Go ahead, Richard. I was just going to say that L.A. and I have this conversation all the time. And there's, in Watchers 8, we showed uh, infrared UFO uh, video. Now, I don't know how much more time we have on the show. I don't want to run you over. But uh, we, we, we showed all of this infrared footage, and I actually captured a UFO, excuse me, flying over um, Pacific Coast Highway, and it was hanging above the street for at least 40 minutes. But it captured it in infrared because of a camera that I was using. And if you, you couldn't see it with the naked eye, but it was up there all the time, which is really kind of creepy. It's like, what what is it doing up there, and, and why is it trying to conceal itself? But all that to say that there's supposed to be a war in heaven, and the scriptures were written centuries ago, so the the way that they describe things is, is is in an ancient format. So the heavens could mean anything. It could be space. It could be the sky. It could be anything. But if there's a war going on in heaven, then it takes two sides to have a war. So I really believe that there are two kinds of what today, because of movies and everything else, we would call aliens are these beings interdimensional most likely that are fighting against each other for for our planet for the souls of the people that are here and what the only reason that Nibiru that I keep mentioning that is because it seems that our Jewish rabbi friends have expected this and they expect UFOs they're not at all surprised 
by the things that are happening because they believe, because of their ancient texts, that all these things have to happen before the Messiah can appear. They believe that that's part of the whole end-time scenario. And if you read articles that um, um, are out about Planet X, uh, there, is, there is a book uh, calling Planet X the return of the the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which is mentioned in Matthew 24. Well, when we read this passage in the book of Numbers, it seems to be the same thing, that before Messiah returns, there's going to be this, you know, I, I see it but not near, and I see it but not now, this kind of thing. It's like it's off in the distance, it's coming this way. And then the Messiah, star will rise up out of Jacob, and that's the Messiah. So this planet coming in to our visual, uh, you know, be able to actually see it is, could be some sort of foretaste of the return of the Messiah. So there you go. I mean, that's, that's what I think we're being, we're, we're starting to experience. And, uh, Steve Quayle just put out a, a really excellent documentary. Um, the Unholy Sea, it's called, S-E-E. And in that, they, they go into this tour of the Vatican's Lucifer telescope, which is a, basically a binocular stereo telescope. And Tom Horn, uh, gives this example, which he told me about privately, and I didn't know he wanted it revealed. So it, since it's in their film, I think it's okay for me to mention this, but they were getting a tour of this telescope, which he understands the Vatican built just to look for Nibiru because they think the same thing. And they were off in the other room, him and, and uh, Chris, and they could hear the scientists saying in the other room, well, we could see this. We could see that they were trying to find this object in space. We could see this object if there weren't so many darn UFOs in the way. And it was like old hat. <laughs> it's like a daily occurrence. Well, well, crap, we can't see this, this planet because it's being obscured by a cluster of, of UFOs. <laughs> so that's why when people like Professor Ripp say, you know, people have no idea what's going on in the universe, I, I must concur. Yes, I I really appreciate you uh, sharing, you know, your insights, your experiences, uh, your intelligence spots on it with our followers today. I really appreciate that. And uh, people, go ahead and look pleasure. up his, uh, his, uh, his website, Richard Shaw. You can get more uh, from his website. And uh, we're going to ask you to hang around for a minute. We're going to, after the show, we're going to put you in the screen room. Richard, it's just been wonderful um, sharing and hearing what you had to say today. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure and privilege to be on your program anytime, Leah. Thank you. Until next time, I'm Leah reminding you that God loves you. Oh, how he loves you.